My name is Dennis Speed, and on behalf of the Schiller Institute, I want to welcome you to today's meeting. Dona nobis pacem, grant us peace through economic development. We're going to open with a selection, the Adagio and Fugue section of the Violin Sonata in G Minor by J.S. Bach, played by Xinhuao Wei. Mrs. LaRouche, distinguished guests, diplomats, and friends. This is the first solo sonata by Bach of the six accompanied sonatas and partitas.
Thank you very much. Uh, let's just make a sure we have a check. Are we, Helga, are you able to hear me? Okay. All right, fine. The idea of this conference is expressed in the graphic that was created for the concert that will follow the conference tomorrow. And it features Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, and Ludwig von Beethoven. Choosing creativity as opposed to tragedy has been the hallmark of the organization, the Schiller Institute, as it was created by the woman who you're about to hear. Back in 1984, when it appeared that the world was also on a tragic course to war, this institution was proposed to the United States. But the United States rejected it, and the founder of this organization then independently created it in collaboration with her husband, Lyndon LaRouche. Many of us were privileged to be part of that when it began. The idea of this organization, the Schiller Institute, is to change thinking change the method by which people deliberate on policy. As Lyndon LaRouche once stated in a document he wrote, the content of policy is the method by which it is made, and that means the conceptual me method by which it's made. We find ourselves today in a very interesting situation internationally, and you're going to hear all about that. Uh, but I just want to say, in introducing the woman who founded this organization, that throughout the world now, the conceptions and the seed crystal of the conceptions that she fought for and recognized the need to uplift in the form of talking about a cultural paradigm shift, that you couldn't simply have a set of programs or policies you had to have a new Hello? set of individuals. And so uh, the conception that we want to give you of what we are trying to do here today is that you also are part of that new paradigm and how you think and how your thinking changes together with uh, many other people from around the world who are part of these deliberations is really the subject of how the changes that we're seeing right now all over the world are going to be affected. Our first panel, a new paradigm of global relations ending geopolitics, is an idea that since particularly 2013 in the case of New York City, we've been doing forums around we tried to force the situation to happen, and we now have that possibility, including the presidency of the United States being integrated into that with Russia, China, and India. And so to tell us how Earth's next 50 years and how this policy of a cultural paradigm and an ending of geopolitics can happen, we are presenting the founder of the Schiller Institute, Helga Zepp LaRouche. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have an echo here. Maybe you can take that away. So, dear friends of the Schiller Institute, well, I'm actually very optimistic about the strategic situation. And I think there is the absolute possibility that we will, in the very near term, 
see the emergence of a completely new paradigm of civilization. Because already now, uh, the majority of nations are all gathering around the idea that there is the one humanity which is of a higher order than national interest, even geopolitical confrontation. And never before has the contradiction and the openness of the fight between the new paradigm, the echo is there again, uh, and the old paradigm uh, and the new paradigm has been more obvious than right now. So uh, this, is, uh, this conference was originally planned to speed this process up and to urge in particular a summit as early as possible between President Trump and President Putin as the only way to outflank the ongoing British-initiated and conducted coup against the United States uh, and, you know, by simply outflanking the level of discussion between the two presidents directly. And now it is quite hopeful that such a summit can take place in the near future. There is talk about that it could take place in July. Uh, and this was initiated when President Putin just concluded a, I would say, historic visit in Austria, uh, where it was proposed that uh, Austria as a neutral country and as a country which very consciously understands itself as a bridge between East and West would be the venue of such a, a conference. And uh, President Putin just expressed today that he is looking forward very much and thinks this will be a very pro productive uh, event. Now, the important changes which are taking place are best illustrated or uh, imaged with the two parallel conferences and summits which are taking place on this weekend. One, the G7 taking place in Canada, and the other one, the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, taking place in Qingdao in China. Now, the one, the G7, most of the countries, or at least some of the countries, want to defend the status quo of the neoliberal geopolitical old paradigm. And the other summit, the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, is typical for those nations which are trying to establish a new order, a win-win cooperation of all nations on this planet. Now, on the G7 meeting, uh, where Trump uh, came late and he's leaving early, and he refused to meet uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, Theresa May, which I think is a good thing, uh, to go as quickly on to Singapore to have the summit with Kim uh, Jong-un. And he brought it to the point when he said that the combination of people meeting at this G7 meeting was really not uh, the one which should uh, come together, but that Russia was missing and that it should be the G8 again. Now, he said this may be politically not correct to say it, but after all, we have a world to run. And I think that that is exactly the spirit. And you could see the disunity of, you know, Macron and Trudeau getting into a France Trump beforehand, even saying, you know, if uh, there will be the tensions with Trump on the trade issue, it will be only a G6 um, <clears throat> or G6 plus one. But then happened something very interesting, namely that the new prime minister of Italy, Dante, uh, uh, also backed up Trump's uh, demand that it should be a G8. And, uh, you know, so maybe it's only the G5 after all. So it is very clear uh, a break in the unity of the European Union, what Conti there did. Now, the problem with the European establishments is that they are completely resistant against learning. They don't understand that the entire model of the world order, as it developed after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the idea to establish a unipolar world to which all countries must submit, and those who do not want to do that get regime change through color revolution or even 
humanitarian intervention wars. And as it happened, you know, in Iraq, in Libya, as it was attempted in Syria, and as it is ongoing in the Ukraine. Now, part of that world order was the idea to have an encirclement of Russia and China, and in those two countries also have ultimately regime change to get rid of President Putin and to get rid of the communist leadership of China, as an unlikely proposition this may be. Now, part of this world order which is collapsing is the neoliberal uh, system which went for the complete deregulation of the financial system, uh, which increased naturally the gap between the rich and the poor. And what we have been seeing now since uh, is a revolt actually on a global scale against that neoliberal dying old system of the British Empire. It was expressed through the Brexit. It was expressed through the election of President Trump and defeat of Hillary Clinton. It was expressed in the vote uh, against the change of the constitution in Italy last year. It was cl coming clear in the election of the present Austrian government and now of the Italian government. So <clears throat> something very noteworthy just happened in Italy which I think it is important for people in the whole world to understand because it is a reflection of why the European model does not function. The two parties which were just uh, elected, the Lega North and the Five Star Movement, were so-called Euro-critical parties, which were actually expressing the same absolute discontent with the neoliberal paradigm uh, as it, it really occurred in the election of President Trump, the Brexit, or the Austrian election. Now, obviously, it was a big uproar in Brussels that you would have a Euro-critical government. So the EU Commissioner Oettinger, uh, who is quite a, quite a, a character, he uh, said openly, the markets will teach the Italians how to vote. Now, that is not exactly in the spirit of democracy, but here you have it. So then, following Oettinger's uh, remarks, the European Central Bank, reported by the Financial Times, started to uh, enable the speculators to speculate against the Italian state bonds by uh, reducing the amount of state bonds they have been uh, buying on a monthly basis and therefore causing the so-called spread uh, to increase to up to 300 points in the difference to the German uh, uh, German bonds. Now, obviously, that was the pressure which was then used by Mattarella uh, to refuse the first proposal to have Giuseppe Conte uh, to become the new prime minister. <clears throat> and, you know, he gave a speech which is really noteworthy uh, because he said that uh, the foreign investors don't like the proposed finance minister, Savona, uh, because he is known to be critical against the euro and he wants to have, have reform, reforms of the eurozone system. Now, <clears throat> basically, uh, Mattarella uh, then uh, basically uh, used uh, Savona and Savona is an establishment economist. Uh, he was a, uh, the head of the Industrial Association in Italy. Uh, he was a minister in a previous uh, moderate uh, government. And he was pro-Euro in the beginning, but only after he realized what were the consequences of the Maastricht uh, Stability Pact of the austerity imposed on Italy by Brussels that it totally ruined the Italian economy that he became critical and demanded that Italy should develop a plan B for the case that it would not uh, work and, and get any better. And he demanded that the Maastricht rules should be renegotiated. Now, Ma Merkel, the German chancellor earlier, had said, uh, yes, we have a democracy, but it is a democracy in conformity with the markets. Now, this Italian case where, you know, the president accepts the pressure from the EZB and the European Union to refuse to nominate uh, a, a prime 
prime minister candidate proposed by those parties which have just won the majority is really an absolute scandal. And it means that democracy does not exist. I think it's a very severe uh, development because, you know, it shows you uh, where we are really in terms of the famous Western values, which they always are talking about. Now, the head of the Italian metal trade union uh, made a noteworthy comment. He said, the fact that an establishment person like Savona is being regarded as subversive shows you how much to the right the European Union has developed in the last decades under the rule of neoliberal policies. And that is exactly the problem. Now, obviously, this tactic failed. It boomeranged uh, the uh, effort to impose a technocratic uh, prime minister also did not work. And now you have the same Giuseppe Conti as uh, <clears throat> prime minister of Italy. Now, obviously, <clears throat> the first thing Conte said is we have to get rid of the sanctions against Russia. Uh, that was also stated by Chancellor Kurz from, from Austria, who will be the chair of the European Union from 1st of July on. And he already promised that he will step by step move to uh, reduce uh, the sanctions and actually get out of the sanctions regime uh, altogether. And then naturally, he uh, Conte announced that there will be a big investment program to recover the industrial development of Italy. Now, therefore, let's look at this. The European unity uh, is only a visual thinking of the people who are uh, <clears throat> suffering from European groupthink. Because if you look at the condition of Europe, uh, you have the Visegrad countries, that is Poland, Czechia, Hungary, and Slovakia. Then you have the Eastern and Central European countries who all want better relations with China and most of them with Russia. The same goes for the Balkan states. It goes for Southern Europe, for Greece, for Italy, for Spain and Portugal, who all want to be hubs of the new Silk Road policy. And uh, basically, uh, so you have no unity. You have on the other side, Brussels, who is insisting on a system which is just a supra bureaucratic uh, huge apparatus. And you have Mrs. Merkel, who demands that Germany and Europe should take its fate in their own hands. And, you know, the foreign minister Maas is demanding that Europe must form new alliances. Now, the question is, what, what countries do they want to form new alliances with, since they are against Russia? Merkel just refused Russia to be brought back into the G8. Russia doesn't want to be in the G8. Why would you join such an obsolete uh, grouping? And, uh, you know, they are also trying to block the influence of China with the new Silk Road. So where should the new alliances come from? Germany is sending for the first time soldiers to maneuvers in the South China Sea, where these ships, where also French soldiers, on, will violate the territories of the Chinese islands. So what is this? What is this idea of Europe? playing a new imperial global role, what the uh, German defense minister von der Leyen is saying all the time. Now, this is an old model. I do not expect any positive changes to come from those core countries who want to defend the status quo. I do expect a lot of positive changes to come from those countries in Europe who want to cooperate with the new Silk Road. But if you con contrast the condition of Europe at this point with what is going on in Asia, it could not be uh, a more dramatic uh, contrast. You have a new model of win-win cooperation, of acting in the interest of the other, of respect for the sovereignty of the other country, of non-interference, of respect for the different social system of the other country, and of the idea to be united for a higher purpose of the one mankind. Now, that policy, which is the result of China's new Silk Road policy, which is now on the table for almost five years and ha which has developed the most incredible dynamic ever. It is the largest infrastructure project in history. 
and it is already clear this will define the new rules of the world. So let's look at what these rules are. Now, <clears throat> at the core of the new strategic realignment which is going on in the world is the comprehensive strategic partnership between Russia and China. And this is also uh, cemented by a very deep personal friendship between President Putin and President Xi Jinping. Putin, uh, who just made a state visit before the SCO summit, was awarded the Friendship uh, Medal of China. And there was a big celebration in the Grand Hall, Great Hall of the People at Tiananmen Square. So Putin just came from a, his annual question and answer uh, session with uh, people, and he answered 87 questions, and it took him something like between six and eight hours, uh, an extensive dialogue with the population. Now, the Russian media reported that 91.3% of, of the Russian population think that wisdom is the most important trait of President Putin. And obviously, he has a tremendous uh, charisma. Now, people uh, also voted on what would be their dream encounter with Putin. 37.8% <clears throat> want to have their picture taken with Putin. 29.9% uh, would like to get a puppy from this dog-loving president. And I would choose that option, naturally. And 22.47% want a big hug from the president. Now, I'm saying this because I know it's upsetting to the people who are used to the demonizing of Putin through the mainstream media. And, you know, I can assure you that this uh, admiration for Putin does not only exist in Russia, it also exists in China. There was just an article in the Chinese media that the reason why tens of millions of Chinese, uh, actually more than 10 million people, have uh, formed a Putin fan club on the internet. Uh, and they said the reason for the Chinese uh, friendly attitude towards Putin is <clears throat> because they, they, shared, they share the disgust about the arrogance of the West. Uh, and they, people note that the treatment of Putin and uh, <clears throat> President Xi in China uh, is the same. Uh, demonizing, just, you know, slandering. And, you know, actually it is the same against President Trump concerning the neoliberal mainstream media. Now, but there are also other Asian countries which are affected by the new Silk Road spirit. Now, uh, during the Obama administration, uh, the policy of the United States was the Asia pivot which was nothing but a geopolitical manipulation of the India-Pacific countries, namely Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and India, trying to form the India-Pacific against China. Now, the aim or the, the argument was to have India, the so-called largest democracy, lining up with the Western democracies against the authoritarian China. Now, that is no longer the case. Uh, there was recently a two-day summit in Wuhan in China where President Modi and President Xi Jinping for two full days in six sessions discussed all kinds of bilateral and multilateral issues. And obviously, uh, this contributed to a reset of the Indian policy towards China. Now, President Modi, Modi just gave a very important speech in uh, Singapore at the Shangri-La Dialogue, where he uh, basically outlined a completely different conception and made an appeal to the world to rise above competitiveness, work together in unity. And he made several references in his speech to the Vedanta philosophy of the Vedas and the Upanishads where he said uh, basically that the essential idea of a oneness of all is what is the basis of the new alliances in Asia. He said Asia and the world will be having a better future 
if India and China work together in trust and confidence and sensitive to each other's interest. He said, the world is at a crossroad. Uh, there are both the temptations to repeat the worst lessons of history, but there is also the path of wisdom. It summons us to a higher purpose, to rise above the narrow view of our interests and, re and re recognize that each of us can serve our interests better when we work together as equals in the larger good of all nations. I'm here to urge you to take that path. No other relationship of India has as many layers as our relationship with China. I firmly believe that Asia and the world will be a, have a better future if India and China work together with trust and confidence, keeping in mind each other's interest. Now, India and China are moving together. There's also a change in Japan in the relationship to Russia. While previously Japan was pretty much part of the Washington consensus, in the recent period, a complete attitude change has occurred of Prime Minister Abe to Russia. Russia and Japan are working together in the economic development of the Kugel Islands. And uh, Abe hopes to be able to sign a peace treaty with Russia in the time while he is still in office. Now, in the beginning, Japan was skeptical to the Belt and Road Initiative of China. But then last May, uh, he sent the Secretary General of the ruling party, of the ruling Liberal Party, Toshihiro Nikai, to the Belt and Road Forum, being, this being the second most important political person in, in, uh, in Japan. And uh, from June 2017 on, Japan is fully cooperating with China on the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, at the same time, Abe also was the first foreign leader to visit uh, President-elect Trump in the Trump Tower on the 17th of November 2016. And he was the first foreign leader to meet uh, Trump in the White House and then Mar a Lago on the 10th of February 2017. So this is also a new alliance emerging. Then if you look at the relationship between China and <clears throat> the United States, Xi Jinping visited uh, <clears throat> President Trump in Mar-a-Lago last April, and they developed an outstanding personal friendship. Xi Jinping returned that invitation by giving an extraordinary tour Uh, in the Forbidden City for President Trump and his wife, uh, and they named it a State Visit Plus. Now, you have now an alliance between all these major nations uh, happening. Putin just commented on the prospective summit with uh, Trump, saying the ball is in our court. Let's make it work. Now, obviously, The world looks full of big expectations at next Tuesday, when there is the meeting going to take place between President Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un. Now, I don't know if there will be the big surprise, everything solved in one day. I don't think so. I think probably uh, Foreign uh, Minister Lavrov is more right when he said that it will require a very skillful orchestration of reducing the sanctions, of moving towards denuclearization in a step-by-step -step fashion in such a way that the security interests of North Korea are being taken care of and that the promise which was made by Russia, that Russia will play a big role in the economic development of North Korea and of uh, <clears throat> President Trump, who said that North Korea going on this path will become a very prosperous country that this will all actually happen. And I think this situation would not be possible without the new Silk Road spirit, which clearly has captured the populations of North Korea and South Korea, who are looking forward very much to this development, which promises to unite the two Koreas, to have railway connections from Pusan all the way to the Trans-Siberian Railway, to the connecting to the uh, uh, Chinese uh, railway, And 
you know, basically, I think this is a, an absolutely hopeful situation which can become the model to resolve all conflicts around the world. Now, this is actually the vision of my husband, Lyndon LaRouche, who already in 2007 demanded that the three countries, Russia, China, and India, absolutely must work together to counter the uh, evil influence of the British Empire as it existed at that time. Now, in 2009, he, at the Rhodes Forum of the Dialogue of Civilization, uh, demanded that the only way how the world would get out of this present condition would be a four-power agreement between the United States, Russia, China, and India. Now, many Asians are convinced that this coming century will be the Asian century. And it is very clear that the economic and scientific momentum is in Asia. If scientists want to do something, they go to China, they go to other Asian countries. And you know the economic growth rates of China and India and some other countries are far, far uh, beyond anything in, in the so-called West. But obviously, this is not sufficient. If we want to have something what Xi Jinping calls a community for a shared future of all of mankind, we need a cultural re renaissance of the best traditions of all nations and cultures. The new Silk Road must be built uh, on the most fundamental ontological and epistemic uh, metaphysical conceptions of all uh, traditions. For China, this means the Confucian principle of self-perfection and lifelong learning, an ennoblement of the character, of a harmony in the midst of differences. For India, this means the Vedic concept about the cosmic order must give the rules for the political life on earth, the concept of the Dharma for the Belt and Road Initiative, the five principles of the Panchil Treaty, the concept of Ahima, uh, that of developing your own character up to the point where you are unable to think any har harmful thoughts. Obviously, European civilization, of which America is a part of, has a lot to contribute in terms of its own humanist traditions. Now, obviously, uh, one of the most important conceptions of this is the new thinking which was introduced by Nicolaus of Cus in the 15th century, the coincidentia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposite, which means that human creativity and the human mind is able to create a higher order in which all differences are vanishing. And the idea that order in the macrocosm can only exist if there is the maximum development of all microcosms, which means all nations must develop in the maximum way and have act in the interest of each other in order to have a harmonious world. It also means the principles of the peace of Westphalia, that in order to overcome war forever, that you have to uh, base foreign policy on love and on the interest of the other. This must also be based on the ideas of Leibniz, that it is exactly the human character and the character of the universe that you always can overcome evil with a greater good. The ideas of Friedrich Schiller, that each human being can be a human, a, a beautiful soul for, for whom duty and passion, necessity and freedom are one. And that the only people for whom this applies are the geniuses. And that the number of geniuses in the world will absolutely increase. Now, these are also the ideas of Vladimir Vernatsky, the Russian scientist of whom my husband, Lyndon LaRouche, in his beautiful book, The Earth's Next 50 Years, which he already wrote about 20 years ago, uh, in which he said that if the <clears throat> Eurasian uh, integration should work, it must be based on the ideas of La Vladimir Vernatsky, that is the idea that the amount or the influence of the noosphere over the biosphere is continuously increasing. With other words, 
that the result of the creative mind is becoming more dominant in terms of the character uh, of, of humanity. And that is actually what we see happening with this development right now. This is obviously the spirit of a completely new era of mankind. Now, this is beautiful and it's happening. So why are people not joining and just say, look, this is a better model. Uh, it is obviously more fitting human nature that we should be united for higher goals and the common aim of, of mankind for the future. Well, it is because <clears throat> European uh, civilizations and part of the United States moved away from their best European traditions, moved away from humanism. The present dominating uh, old paradigm uh, model is based on neoliberal and left liberal ideas, which can be traced back directly to the Frankfurt School uh, and their so-called critical method. Now, I don't have time now to uh, <clears throat> discuss this in, in depth, but I can assure you I have looked at this in the past uh, very much uh, in detail. And this is a completely destructive idea. It is the idea that you cannot have anything beautiful, truthful, uh, that you cannot have a definite criteria for morality, uh, but that everything can be put into question and, you know, that anybody who claims that, that he has a way to know the truth in a scientific manner or that you can define with scientific precision what is beauty is a so-called authoritarian character. Now, just recently came out a big study of a German think tank called Marix, which is a complete attack on the Belt and Road Initiative of China uh, and attacking it as the authoritarian model. Now, obviously, what China is doing is, uh, you know, based on the effort to establish truth, uh, the effort to establish the common good for the people, and to make the world more beautiful. This has been stated repeatedly by Xi Jinping at the 19th National Congress of the CPC and at recent uh, other such events. And I have come to the conclusion that that is also what <clears throat> is really inspiring uh, President Putin and many other leaders uh, of, of the developing countries. Now, obviously, this old geopolitical thinking, which is really degenerated up to the point where, in terms of values, they have adopted the principle, everything goes, everything is allowed. And, you know, this is ab absolutely something which has led to the present deep cultural crisis in the West, in America, the drug epidemics, the fact that the life expectancy is going down in all age brackets, while the healthy life bracket in China is obviously increasing for the first time above that of the United States. So obviously, we need a cultural renaissance. And part of the reason why we have this concert tomorrow is because this will give you a sense of what is the new paradigm, what we absolutely have to accomplish in the tradition of the most beautiful accomplishments of European classical traditions. Now, if the presidents, uh, Trump, uh, Putin, uh, <clears throat> uh, Prime Minister Modi, Xi Jinping, and together with other leaders of the developing countries and also hopefully some European countries, are get together on these new ideas. This will mean the end of geopolitics and therefore the end of the causes of war as we have known them. Now, a big question is, which is being asked around the world is, can President Trump prevail in light of the coup against him, in light of the influence of the what people mistakenly call the deep state, the military industrial complex, and something which would be better called just plainly the British Empire. Are these forces too powerful to overwhelm President Trump? Now, one has to understand the role of the British Empire, uh, against which, after all, the American was, revolution was fought in the War of Independence. Uh, and, you know, we have published a lot of things about the two-century-long efforts 
to undermine, subvert uh, <clears throat> the American model of uh, the Republic. Now, obviously, uh, up to the election of Trump, the British Empire was extremely successful in corrupting the American establishment to adopt the model of the British Empire as their own to rule the world on the basis of a unipolar world. We have seen that in the cases of the Bush administrations, in the Obama administration, and you know, obviously the reason why all the uh, <coughs> hysteria against Trump occurred and Russia Gate was initiated with the help or the, the initiation by the British Secret Services was because Trump is breaking with that tradition. And this is the significance of what Spygate is all about. And remember that President Trump recently sent out a tweet where he said, Spygate is becoming the biggest scandal in American history. Now, we have published several important reports, which we should circulate and you should help us to circulate internationally. Because if Spygate can be uh, totally uncovered, this will be the biggest catharsis you have ever seen, where everything which went wrong in the last uh, more than 50 years since the assassination of John F. Kennedy, of uh, Robert, John, uh, Robert Kennedy uh, in 1968 and Martin Luther King, and the half century of humiliation will be overcome and concluded and must be replaced with the best tradition of American culture and the American Revolution. So I'm asking you, join with the Schiller Institute to get exactly that accomplished. America must join with the new Silk Road and we have together to create a new paradigm for all of mankind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helga, for that. We are going to now play a message from Dr. Zhu Wenhong, the Deputy Secretary General of the Center for Belt and Road Studies, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, we have given a copy of this out also for people who wanted to have a uh, transcript of what he had to say. And if there are others that need it, just put your hand up and we can supply that. So. Uh, his uh, talk is called The One Belt, One Road Initiative. Dear participant of Dear Madam Helga Lausch, Dear participant of this event, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very honored to be here to speak something on One Belt, One Road. In 2007, when I first time met with Madam Helga Lausch, I've got to know from her that she and her Schiller Institute have been promoting the Third Land Bridge project for many years. She and Schiller Institute still are one of the pioneers in this field. On top of that, we've got so much achievement. Congratulations. Actually, One Bed One Road Initiative is an updated version of the Third Land Bridge project. One belt means Silk Road Economic Belt. It was coined by the Chinese President Xi Jinping in his speech on September 27, 2013, at Nazarbayev University, Kazakhstan. One road means 21st century Silk Road. It was Measure, firstly mentioned by the Chinese President Xi Jinping in his speech addressing to the National Assembly in Malaysia on October 7, 2013. After that, we call these two terms in short, one bed, one road. Western people compare one bed, one road initiative as the Marshall Plan, but the initiative is totally different from the Marshall Plan. It's much more meaningful, it's much bigger than Marshall Plan. 
One bet, one road initiative has three principles consensus, win win, and sharing. That means all move with the framework of one bet, one road initiative should be based on well recognized consensus. Only the consensus could get more achievement. And all parties should have the equal rights this initiative, and all parties could equally benefit from this initiative. One bad one road initiative focused on five sectors. That means policy coordination, transportation connectivity, impacted trade, financial cooperation, and people-to-people -people exchange. When we're talking about the policy coordination, at least we should be talking about uh, at four levels. When we're talking about policy coordination, at least we should be talking about at the four levels coordination. That means we should be based on the common understanding of surroundings, common understanding of upcoming tasks. When we're talking about uh, transportation connectivity, we are talking about seaport, airport, the gas pipeline, cable pipeline, and other infrastructure constructions. When we're talking about impacted trade, we know that for many years, China has become the top trading partner to many countries. When we're talking about financial cooperation, we know that within the framework of One Belt, One Road initiative, we have built Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, Silk Road Fund, and other financial institutions. When we're talking about people-to-people -people exchange, we know that this time, only in 2017, we have more than 100 million Chinese people go abroad for travel. At the same time, we have more and more tourists from all over the world to China. Also, when we're talking about the aims and goals of One Bed, One Road initiative, we know that we are fighting for three communities. Community of common interests, community of common responsibilities, and community of shared destinies. These communities are not military alliance, but new form for economic cooperation. To sum up, with this initiative, China is ready to join hand with all willing countries to fight for a just, fair, reasonable world order, to make a bad world, to make the global village full of peace stability, to make the whole global village full of peace, prosperity. I hope you all can understand the, the true meaning of One Bed, One Road initiative and join this initiative. Thank you. Dear Madam Chair, Our next presentation will be by Jason Ross, the co-author of the Schiller Institute Special, special Report, report. Extending, extending the New Silk Road to West Asia and Africa, a vision of an economic renaissance. Okay, thanks very much. I'm happy to be here, and I'd like to address the Belt and Road Initiative in a, another part of the world that people may not think about its influence being in, and that is Africa. I want to do this for the reason of bringing to light the most key aspect about the role of government, the role of society, which is to provide a functioning society in which people are ensured while they live that at the time of their death, they will be able to reflect on their lives and know that they were well spent, that you've contributed something of immortal and enduring value. This is the purpose of government. Now, how does that get achieved? What are the means by which human beings live such a life? And how does the Belt and Road Initiative make it more possible for the world as a whole to increasingly move in this direction, including the United States? 
I'm going to briefly look at Africa as a case study to help bring to light the differences between the current paradigm of Western financial powers compared to what China is doing. And then I want to take it up a level to Lyndon LaRouche's economics and what we should do moving forward. So let's uh, move ahead now. The overall view here is we're going to take these three aspects next. I want to start by, in the next slide, we can see the, we'll go one more. We can see a document up here. This is NSSM 200, National Security Study Memorandum 200, authored in 1974 under the direction of Henry Kissinger, advisor to the president. This document said that it was US strategic policy to view the increase in population of many developing countries as a threat to the United States. This said that development and population growth was a threat to US strategic interests, and that population growth should be curbed. That countries that don't act on their own to reduce their population growth, well, the United States should stop offering food aid to countries that are simply having too many children. OK, it's a pretty disgusting outlook. In what kind of world is the growth of population somewhere a threat? Well, in a world where your own dominance becomes your reason for being, rather than actually having a mission of moving towards the future. And this is the British outlook. I use a US document as an example, but the origin of this outlook, this is the British outlook that we fought a revolution against and need to finish off that revolution today to eliminate. The United States has an essential role in the world in eliminating the British Empire outlook and the British Empire from the face of the planet. This will end geopolitics. This is the job of the United States. Let's move ahead here. Let's hear how President Obama described when speaking to young Africans in a visit to South Africa what he thought about development in this part of the world. Here in Africa, if everybody's... Well, maybe this is a blessing. We can't world. hear him. <laughs> maybe we'll stick with that. Everybody's got a... Okay. Big house. Uh, well, the planet will boil over. Okay, maybe you heard at least the ending. We don't need to play it again. President Obama said that if people in Africa have a big house and air conditioning, the world will boil over. Well, it's the kind of nonsense that says, I'm sorry, other parts of the world have developed, but those parts that have yet to do so won't. It's the same kind of outlook. Let's look next at another supposed hero in many people's eyes, Winston Churchill. I think many people here might know that he's certainly no hero, as these quotations from him about Indians and about other groups around the world and his view of the dominance of the white race, not as a culture, but actually as a race. This is the outlook that has to be eliminated. So let's move ahead now, and let's contrast that with another outlook. We'll move ahead one more. This is an image from promotional material for an agency that seeks to help build wells so that communities have access to water. So is this a, uh, is this a good thing? It is, but it's not modern. It is, but it's not modern. OK. It's not enough. So sometimes people say, well, this is a good thing to do. It's charity. It's a good thing to do. It's not a good thing to do. When we talk about whether something's good, what we usually mean is that it's better than something else. In this case, you might say having a well is better than not having a well. But since when is not having water even an option? Right? Is this better than having a faucet that you turn in your home that you live in? And another faucet where the water is heated with the electricity that you have? No. This is worse. This is bad. Next slide. I think people may have seen this. If you're not sure what to give a relative for Christmas or their birthday, you can donate. How insensitive. People are laughing. You can give a goat to a family in need. So what, what's, can somebody say why they laughed at this? Why is this funny? Well, they don't eat the goat. I, they, you know, you milk it or whatever. But 
Um, any, why, why else did, can anyone else say why they laughed at this? Well, for one thing, it's remarkably condescending. The other thing is, again, it's saying this is something that comes from the standpoint of, oh, some countries will simply never develop. They'll always be poor. And we can help people there be a little bit less poor. That's not good, that's bad. If you live in a country that has had a policy that has prevented development, kept people poor, said that for environmental reasons it's not okay to build any coal-fired power plants, which the World Bank has said won't give any loans for this in Africa, well, you have an obligation to change that policy, not to give somebody a goat. That's sort of like, um, you know, killing a child's parents and then giving them a nice birthday gift. Is that a nice thing to do? Well, no. Okay. Let's move on. Serious. Okay. But people say, well, it's impossible. Africa's so corrupt. Nothing can ever get done. Not true. But I don't, there's not much time to say more about that. Let's move on to the next. Um, let's talk about a very different outlook. So this is a report made by the LaRouche movement in 1980 on the industrialization of Africa. In the next slide, we see Mr. LaRouche lecturing in Russia, which was the first place that he went after he got out of prison, um, the highest federal office he held, where he was appointed by George Bush to prison. Um, when he got out in 94, when he was paroled, he went to Russia. Here's development plans for the Indian Pacific Basin. And then on the next slides, we see some of the first descriptions of what has become the World Land Bridge proposal of the LaRouche movement, of the Schiller Institute. This is an issue of EIR from 1992, and then a special report that was put out in 1997. On the next slide, we see Helga Tsepp LaRouche, who we just heard from, in 96 in Lian Yungang at the, it says, eastern terminal of the new Eurasia Land Bridge. So the proposal by the LaRouche movement was that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, with the end of the division into East and West, the end of the Cold War, it would be possible to move forward on common development projects. The next slide, we have a picture here of President Xi Jinping making his speech in September 2013 in Kazakhstan, announcing the formation of the Belt and Road Initiative. Now let's talk about what this has meant um, in using Africa as a case study, African nations as case studies. Next slide, please. Here, even the New York Times had to run an optimistic headline. They wrote, joyous Africans take to the rails with China's help. In the next picture, we'll see what people are so happy about. So here's a map. You can see in the lower right the uh, location of Ethiopia in Africa, if you're not so good on your geography there. And Ethiopia is landlocked. Most of its goods that come from other nations go through Djibouti. And the time it would take to get from Djibouti to the Ethiopian capital of Addis, it was hours, it was days with trucks. With this new, next picture, new rail line that was built by a Chinese construction firm, mostly, of course, with Ethiopian um, workers, and financed by the Chinese Export-Import Bank, there's now an electrified rail line. So do you ever see any charities asking if you could help a family in need by building a rail line in the nation? No. no. Okay. So what is really needed for development? For example, in China, I'm sure many of you have heard this, in the past three decades, 700 million Chinese have been taken out of poverty. Was that because of donations from the other 500 million Chinese? No. It was by building up an infrastructure network, by building up the economy as a whole. Next slide. Let's take a look at another example. This is in Kenya. Next picture. This is the uh, rail line that was built from Mombasa to Nairobi to replace the very antiquated one. Instead of two days of travel, it's now about eight hours for freight to get from the port to Nairobi. How does this change the entire region when you've got such connectivity to the rest of the world? The plan is to extend the rail through, you can see, Kampala and Uganda, and then down into Rwanda and into Burundi. Currently, Rwanda and Burundi, if you want to get something there, like one of those big, um, you know, like semi-trailers, uh, they call them 20-foot equivalent units, one of these big, you know, shipping containers, 
it can cost 10 times as much as getting something like that to, say, Egypt or South Africa, which has good port facilities. By building this, you make it possible to make everything easier to get. That's development. And how is this financed? The Chinese Export-Import Bank. Let's move on to the next picture here. Just, uh, here's a picture of it. Let's move on. This is all detailed, which much more in the wonderful report available outside. And uh, moving on, I think we're going to have to move a little quicker here. So here's Xi Jinping. This is in May 2017 at the Belt and Road Forum, held with, as you can see, the attendance of over, you know, over 100 nations were represented. Dozens of heads of state personally were there. In the next picture, we can see an image of Helga Tsepp LaRouche, who is an invited participant at this forum, and her view that this is the formation of a new world economic order. In part, this is a new world economic order that she and her husband, Lyndon LaRouche, have been instrumental in proposing around the world. Let's move on. And uh, here's some images. Let's keep moving. I want to get to, um, let's move one more ahead. Actually, one more. OK, here we go. This is Lin Song Tian. He is, I believe, the ambassador to South Africa from China. And after Rex Tillerson made a visit to Africa, in which he said that African nations should beware of China, that China was acting as a colonial power. This is what the ambassador had to say. He said, no. What the West wants is to keep Africa as it was, poor and divided, controlled by others. What they worry about is a strong Africa that can no longer be ordered around politically. So what China's doing in Africa, this isn't charity. Frankly, it just makes such complete sense. You've got the part of the world that has the most opportunity for the growth of population, growth of economy. And if you don't have a colonial type of outlook, it's a natural place to work together. Let's move ahead and uh, move to the conclusion. Well, here we go. This is a simple example. Where is US investment in African nations? 66% mining. In China, you see the investment's much more in construction and manufacturing. We'll move on to the next picture, and then another one. Um, we'll go back one. Just very briefly, just to put the continent of Africa in perspective, here you see it with other nations uh, inlaid. China is the big red country. Upper left, purple, US. India, a billion people, more than a billion, in orange. Next picture. Here, created by size, by population. Let's move on. Here, by energy. So total energy use in China is more than in the US. Total energy use in Africa is a third that of the US, despite having many more people. Let's move ahead. Here's energy use per person. Without energy, you don't have development. What kind of energy will we use next? Let's talk about transportation. Actually, we'll skip transportation. We're short on time. Let's keep moving. Um, again, water. Let's actually skip over Lake Chad. This is an incredibly important project that will bring water from the upper reaches of the Congo River and its tributaries to refill a lake that has been shrinking over the past 50 years. The project has been proposed for decades and only now finally is getting some very significant support from Italy and from China. We'll move ahead to the, uh, yep, keep moving. Okay, so here's energy. Let me say a little bit more about energy. This is a chart. I use all the time. Each dot is a country. On the horizontal axis, energy use per capita. On the vertical axis, GDP per capita. Not the perfect measure, but a good one. Do you see any wealthy nations that use very little energy? Where would such a nation appear on this chart? Which, which area of it? If, you have a, if you're very wealthy, but you use very little energy, where would you be? Top left. Yeah, and there's nothing there. OK. Without energy, you don't have economy. In the next slide, we see Africa at night as it appears today. Literally dark, not a lot of light. 
next? What could it look like? You know, what would a full development perspective be? This is the kind of image for the future to have, not goats. Next picture. I want to say a little bit about one very specific energy project. So here you've got the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, which has the Congo River. And in the, uh, you can see where it heads out to the Atlantic Ocean there. In the next slide, we get another view of this. And uh, you can see the red marker there, the Inga Dam site. Next. This is a place where the river, the elevation drops dramatically. And you've got the Congo River, so obviously a huge water flow. This one location could be a, a place where hydropower dams could be built, creating 40,000 megawatts of energy. Just to put that in perspective, the typical use in America per capita is about 1,200 megawatts. So this would be enough energy, this one hydropower complex, for 35 million people. In the DRC, currently, average energy use per person is 11 watts. Not enough for a light bulb. But hey, plenty of fast moving water. Easy to make electricity, right? Well, the World Bank was involved in studying this proposal. And then in 2016, the World Bank said, we're out. This might impact the fish. Now, I don't know if people know this, but people are people, too. OK? <laughs> Far more important than a fish. OK, let's move on. So uh, <laughs> another subtle reminder. And then uh, so the last thing here, what, do we, what can we do about, what can we learn from this, and how can we apply the higher level of economic thinking of LaRouche to the United States in a few brief moments? So uh, next we see the. Not surprising report card for American infrastructure, a D plus. Next. And I think one of the worst disasters in the US, even worse than the subway system, is the economics profession. You want to talk about a train wreck, this is it. And I'll wrap up with, with this and then one aspect of where we go from here. In 2007, these are the results of a survey taken of American economic forecasters. The economists said that there was a 3% chance of any economic decline in 2008. They said that the odds were 1 in 500 of a decline of over 2%. What happened in 2008? Yeah. So the thing that was given odds of less than 1 in 500 is what happened. So does that mean that 499 out of 500 economists across the country were fired? <laughs> That's what should happen. So let me, I'm gonna, we're going to move ahead now to my last slide about an economist who did not fail in this way, Lyndon LaRouche, who used a physical measure of economy, of, uh, we'll keep moving, of the potential population that can be supported. And I want to say something very briefly about his four principles of economics. So today, in the United States, what's required for us to join the Belt and Road Initiative, but really do more than that, is to put our economy in line with the economic science of where wealth is created. So our minds, we're able to discover how the universe works. We use that knowledge, which everyone is capable of contributing to. Quarks don't care what part of the world your ancestors came from. Um, electromagnetism does not care if you are a man or a woman. These are universal principles, and everyone can play a role in discovering these. This is something universal to all of us, something we can all learn from. By discovering these and then implementing this knowledge, we improve how we live. It's great. We're the best species on Earth. So first off, we need Glass-Steagall to s shut down Wall Street and end the idea that somehow Wall Street is not only an important part of the economy, but even any part of the economy. Second, we need a national bank for infrastructure and manufacturing. There's a lot of projects that clearly will pay huge returns in making the economy more productive, which won't make any money. The private sector will never build them. We need a national bank to finance these. Third, we've got to direct this credit 
towards projects that increase our physical power over nature, so things like high-speed rail, new power plants, water treatment systems, a far better educational system, and then last, a commitment to new science. So this means nuclear fusion, this means space science. I want to say one thing about nuclear on the previous slide, and then I'll conclude. Oh, sorry, one slide before that. Very simple diagram. On the left is chemical fuel. The molecule on the left, anybody know what that is? Methane. It's methane. Where do you find methane? <laughs> you might find it just about anywhere, depending on, uh, but it, it's a uh, natural gas, so in your stove, or you might find it in a bathroom. And um, you also, on the right, you've got a nuclear reaction, where two nuclei, tiny, 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 combine and create a large amount of energy. This nuclear reaction on the right creates two million times as much energy as one chemical reaction. So there's only so much we can do with chemical fuels. And there's even less that we can do with solar power. What we can do, you want solar power? Make a sun. And that's what fusion means. Create a sun, and then you've got the best form of solar power. It's right there. You don't have to wait for the light to come from far away. You've got it right with you. And that'll transform our relationship to energy. It'll transform our relationship to water. You can desalinate the oceans, no problem. Our relationship to materials. Materials processing, piece of cake. We won't even need carbon, uh, coal anymore to process metals. We won't have to do it chemically anymore. And space we'll actually be able to get out and go places in space quickly instead of the slow trips that we take right now. So when we find an asteroid coming our way, we'll be able to actually do something about it. So those are the, that's, the, that's in brief the LaRouche proposal for the steps needed in the United States, and they come from the guiding principle that the basis of economics and the purpose of society is to improve the ability of members of society to contribute to making such discoveries and living in a society that's moving forward in that way. Not every American was directly involved in the space program, but everybody benefited by being a member of a nation that was committed to it. And that's the kind of optimistic sense of um, pride that we'll be able to have when we adopt a future-oriented mission and eliminate the British Empire. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. In introducing the next speaker, I just want to point something out. At a very dark time in American history, between 1861 and 1865, when the country almost disappeared, the nation of Russia and its leader, Alexander II, allied with our nation and was instrumental in preserving it. That is, together with Abraham Lincoln, Alexander II, freed serfs in Russia and slaves in America. In the 20th century, at a very dark time in European history, when Russia had been invaded by Hitler's armies, Franklin Roosevelt, and even prior to that time, Franklin Roosevelt, made sure that the United States joined together with the Soviet Union, and fought against fascism. And that was a proud moment. Today, it is the intent, certainly, of the Schiller Institute, and as we understand it, apparently, of the President of the United States, to make sure that there is a new form of cooperation, of peace through development. And it is our hope that today, as you listen to the next speaker, you think of ways in which you can contribute to making sure that a new paradigm of global relations that ends geopolitics actually comes into being. So it's my honor to introduce to you Dmitry Polyansky, first deputy permanent representative of the Russian Federation to the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very much honored to be here. 
Uh, to be quite frank, I didn't prepare a special speech for this event, uh, but I am absolutely open to any suggestions, any comments, and I would be most uh, ready to answer your questions. Uh, the topic of your discussion, I think, is, is very important. Uh, grant us peace through economic development. This is very much uh, echoing the uh, policy of the Russian government, because we are open to fruitful and mutually beneficial cooperation with all the countries in the world, uh, without any exception. Uh, some people may assume that uh, there is a certain uh, anti-American mood in my country because of all the obstacles that we are facing in the world arena, because of all of, this, of the criticism that uh, we are hearing. But this is, this is not true. Uh, we still remain very friendly towards the United States. Uh, we have still maintain very big interests uh, towards what's happening in this country. Uh, we know that this country has a great history. We know that Americans are very wise people, and uh, they will take good decisions. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Churchill once said that Americans always take uh, the right decisions, but only after they uh, tried all the wrong ones. <laughs> so I think eventually the, the, the good one will prevail, and maybe we are very close to it. Uh, and uh, very much depends on our interaction uh, with Washington. Uh, it's not because we are big states, uh, it's because uh, we are responsible states. Uh, we, st we understand uh, very, very well uh, what's happening in the world, we understand the challenges, we understand the possibilities, and uh, I'm absolutely sure that our interlocutors, they, are, they understand also what can, uh, how can the world benefit from uh, close cooperation and uh, trust uh, between Russia and the United States. I think trust is the key word here. And we in the United Nations are trying to work as hard as we can for the re-establishment of trust. We discuss uh, all the topics uh, with our partners, including American partners. We don't have any taboos in our discussion, and we value very much this, the cooperation that we have. Uh, speaking about trust, I would say that uh, during last uh, several years, maybe 10 years, maybe a little bit less, we have advanced very much on the path of establishment of trust and uh, mutually beneficial cooperation with China. Uh, China is our most important partner. Uh, we very much uh, like the Chinese people. We expanded uh, to, a, to a large extent the exchanges between uh, our peoples, people-to-people -people contact. There are a lot of uh, Russian tourists in China right now, and there are a lot of Chinese tourists in Moscow. Uh, Chinese language is now very widely taught uh, in Russia, including in schools. Uh, Russian language is very popular in China as well. So we are making steps towards uh, better understanding each other. It's not always easy to read the Chinese mind for us, really. It's a big challenge. But we do not uh, teach other people how to live and what to do and what not to do. We're not intrusive, we're not assertive. And that's why we proceed from mutual understanding of respect to the history, to the traditions. We really believe in the fact that being different doesn't mean being dangerous. And that is the cornerstone of our relations with other countries, including China. Uh, our pivot to the, to the East that was declared uh, several years ago uh, is not something that is being made you know, uh, in retaliation to the attitude of the West. This is the long-awaited move that we should have really taken, regardless of the fact how our relations with the United States and with, with the West would develop. Okay. I'm not disturbing you, I hope. Okay. So uh, we, really, uh, we, we really should have done this, uh, should have made this step a uh, long time ago. And uh, the events that followed uh, after the crisis in the relations of uh, Russia and the West, after the... Uh, uh, heaps and oodles of misunderstandings that we have now in our relations. These events, of course, accelerated our m mutual, uh, mutual movement uh, towards each other with China. So we supported uh, very actively this One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, we have a lot of uh, common projects together. We have understanding that uh, the concept of Eurasian integration, which is being promoted by Russia and by some of our partners from CIS countries, uh, does not contradict, and uh, even I would put it uh, like this, that it uh, supplements very, very well the initiative of One Belt, One Road. 
So uh, we include uh, these topics in all the consultations that we have with Beijing. Uh, recently, uh, we signed uh, an uh, agreement on uh, cooperation between Eurasian Economic Union and China. This is not about free trade agreement. Free trade agreement is a very challenging move. Maybe it will be a next step. Uh, but this is something that would really bring us uh, closer together. Uh, it gives us uh, a diff additional leverage and tools to promote cooperation, first of all, economic cooperation, to streamline the procedures, to avoid red tape, uh, and again, to bring our, our peoples and our countries uh, towards each other. Uh, it's very important to point out that um, Russia and China are not making friends against somebody. It's not a closed club. It's not something that we are together like, you know, G2, uh, forming, <laughs> forming something, some alliance against America, against the West. No, uh, absolutely not. We understand that, uh, that our Chinese friends and partners have very important economic uh, interests in, in the United States, in Europe, and it would be crazy of us to demand that uh, China would uh, abolish these policies and uh, absolutely be friends uh, only with us. It would be a bit childish and, I would say, uh, not reasonable to be such, such jealous people about uh, cooperation of other countries. So we support every move in the world that is leading to some kind of detente, that uh, is leading to some kind of better understanding. Uh, among different countries. We supported the uh, move uh, by, by President Trump uh, to engage in negotiations with, no, with North Korea. Some people said that Russia was jealous because Russia is not participating. It's okay for us. If you guys come, can come to terms with North Korea, we would welcome it, really, very sincerely. If you want us to participate at some later stage, we will participate. If you don't want us to participate, we don't want to participate. No problem. We don't want to bother you. We want peace and cooperation prevail, bilaterally, multilaterally, in any format possible. And we are against hate speech, and we are against uh, uh, neglecting the principle of presumption of innocence, which is uh, very often omitted vis-a-vis -vis Russia today, unfortunately, in many cases. And we have to face it uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we really hope that uh, there will be better understanding between us uh, and people in Washington. Uh, there was a very difficult time until recently. There are some, uh, I would say, uh, some glimpses of hope right now. They are very, very fragile, and uh, I would say that we need to work a little bit and to understand whether they are sustainable or it's uh, really a matter of chance. Uh, but we have hope. Uh, we, we are patient people. Uh, thanks to economic sanctions, we have become almost uh, self-sustainable in many spheres. First of all, with, with regards to European Union. So uh, five, six years ago, I never imagined that Russia can produce such big number of agricultural products like cheese, for example. I was absolutely sure that we are incapable of making good, sh good cheese. So, <laughs> but. I turn to be absolutely wrong, because if you come to Russian shops right now, you will see that there are really, very, really very good and very high quality cheeses, beers, I don't know, everything else. So we are not depending on the, on the West in this regard. There are certain, certain things that we really are still dependent, like drugs and medicine, so we are not really uh, keen to disrupt uh, co cooperations, but we will cope, even if the, the uh, times will come that will be harder and more difficult for us, we will cope, we will survive. No problem. But we really hope that uh, people here will become more mature in terms of international politics, that they will feel more responsibility towards what they are doing, and we will be able to join our efforts uh, in, in wider formats. Uh, I heard recently that uh, there, are, uh, there are ideas of bringing Russia to G8, for example, but uh, this is not very actual for us at this stage. Uh, actually, we were initially preferring G20 uh, than G8, and uh, I think that this format is better now. It's more or less balanced economic format that really reflects uh, the situation in today's world. So we, we would be very keen to promote uh, the, this format. That's in a nutshell. I don't know whether it was helpful or not, uh, but uh, I can assure you that uh, we would not spare any effort uh, to bring our countries together and to, ma to make our world a safer place. So. I will, I think, sit down, and if you have any questions uh, at 
any topic, no taboos here, I will be very glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, so we're now open for discussion and questions. I, the microphone is here for people to go to for questions. Is that correct? Okay, so anyone who has a question, or do we have something additional? You're just going to, what is it? Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to ask Helga and the representative of Russia both, if you look forward over the next period, uh, and you've got the, <clears throat> as Helga uh, emphasized in her remarks, the SEO event ongoing this weekend. You've got the North Korea-U.S. summit in three days. Uh, then there's the discussion of a potential U.S.-Russia summit, perhaps as early as July, uh, and so on. What my question is for both of you, your thoughts about the prospects, uh, the kind of discussion coming out of this weekend, the kind of discussion which could be taken up between President Trump and President Putin, the subject areas the potential to transform the very significant prospects which are ongoing, but to build on that. Ms. Helga. You want to, Mr. Polyansky, you want to answer first, or you want me to go ahead? Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overestimate the importance of the top political level. Of course, it's important if, if uh, two leaders come together and go get on terms on certain issues. But I would think that uh, the more important is, would be the dialogue among ordinary people, among maybe civil society. The problem that, that I see now, I'm here in America only four months now, and I see that a lot of people really uh, don't understand what's happening in Russia and have very clear uh, anti-Russian sentiments that are being driven by some pieces of information that I really don't understand. Uh, like everybody is saying, asking me questions when they know that I'm Russian in the street. Very simple people are asking, why did you meddle in our elections? <laughs> I say, how do you know? <laughs> they, say, they say that you're meddling. Okay, okay, I will say that I'm from the moon, so will you believe me? <laughs> that's, that's the level of expertise, really. And it's more important to rebuild trust. Between, between, our, between our two peoples. So we initially in Russia in the beginning of the 90s were very much welcoming the American presence in, in our country. We were really hoping that Americans will bring us economic expertise, uh, good advice, money, and the world will be prosperous and uh, there will be no, no more conflicts. We are a bit naive, but since then uh, we, we lost a lot of trust in your country, frankly speaking that we feel that there is a very clear hidden agenda because almost everything, behind almost everything that you are doing. And even if our presidents come together, even if there is some kind of detente and, uh, I don't know, love to it between our countries, uh, I think that we shouldn't be uh, too optimistic about this. We need to reestablish the trust and reestablish the desire of common people uh, to see each other and to do away with all the stereotypes that we have. So we need more to, uh, to come here and to go there, to bring our people together, to bring young people together, to understand that we are really not enemies but friends and we can uh, do together a lot. So I would make an accent on this particular development rather than some artificial summits and uh, benchmarks. They come and go and uh, our countries remain there. So my counts of, uh, counts of men are very friendly, very optimistic. Uh, we don't bear grudge against the United States, a personal grudge against some politicians. We understand that you're a big country and you really need to have some time to understand uh, what's happening and uh, how to deal with it. And we are patient people. We are not pressing you. Thank you. So Helga, would you have anything to say? Well, I obviously think that uh, people's to people's communication and to <clears throat> get to know the other culture, the beauty of the other culture, and you know, normally you find that people, ordinary people, are warm-hearted. Most people, simple people, tend to be much better 
than you know the official <clears throat> the official you know institutions at least in the west i can i can say that however uh, i think we are in a historical period which is really you know dramatically changing you know we we experience in my view the collapse of an era and i have made several times the point that i think that the kind of change we experience right now is as big if not bigger than the change from the middle ages to the modern times and you know if you look at the axioms which are <clears throat> characteristic for the middle ages in europe you had the scholasticism you had the peripatetics the neo aristotelians you had witch belief and you know then came the italian renaissance and you know because of the work of nicolaus of cus nicolaus krasanski and you know the <clears throat> whole uh, introduction of plato which was brought by the <clears throat> um, by the orthodox delegation going to the council of florence uh, you know you had a renaissance of platonism and you know you had a, all of a sudden a completely new image of man a modern image of the individual the role of the state being responsible for the common good which did not exist before and out of that developed modern science and and classical art as we as we know it so you know this was a paradigm shift and i think this what we are experiencing right now is a similar paradigm shift where in the past you had empires you had colonialism you had <clears throat> um you know the consequence of colonialism is working still to the present day uh, if you look at the condition of africa as it still is in large parts or as other developing countries this is the result of hundreds of years of colonialism and for that matter the imf conditionalities which did not allow uh, any development but then came uh, the new silk road idea of xi jinping and the reason why it is so extremely attractive and and you know gaining so much support is because it addresses exactly the fundamental need of these people in africa and latin america and and even parts of europe so what you see right now in my view is the emergence of a new paradigm about men about how nations should work together the new model of uh, great power relationship which is being implemented right now in a perfect way between russia and china but which xi jinping has also offered uh, <clears throat> uh, to to the united states uh, you have the much bigger emphasis on innovation on the excellence of education and you know i think that what we are witnessing right now is a transformation to what i would call euphemistically the adulthood of mankind that if we can overcome the remaining big problems which are big like the west is still threatened with a danger of a financial collapse uh you know the deutsche bank situation uh, the italian banking system is not the only one which is bankrupt it's it's many uh, banks which are actually if you uh, discount the derivatives you you have actually a situation of a total lack of liquidity so that is a big threat, uh, challenge because if you have an uncontrolled collapse of the financial system everything could be thrown into chaos so i'm not saying that the present transformation is going to be easy but i think that on top of the or in addition to the civil society exchanges you do need leadership from the top and i think we have the fortune that you have outstanding leaders right now i think uh, uh, president xi jinping is uh, an absolutely outstanding personality deeply confucian uh, uh, educated uh, and i think president putin also is a absolute incredible strategist uh, who you know is also has outwitted uh, evil forces who wanted to reduce the status of russia after the collapse of the soviet union to be a third world raw material producing country um and president putin has been able to reverse that to not totally yet but he's on a absolute fantastic way of doing that and therefore i think you know and hopefully we will have some other 
important leaders emerging. But I think leadership in this period is also very important. And the reason why we proposed very early on uh, a summit between uh, Trump and Putin is because, you know, the whole Russia gate was designed to prevent President Trump from fulfilling his election promise that he would improve the relationship with Russia by, you know, piling on him that, you know, he only came to the White House because of Putin and meddling and so forth. You know, this was designed to box him in so much that he did not uh, feel able to meet Putin until the G20 in Hamburg last, last year. And he met him also on the sidelines of some other summit. But, you know, to have an in-depth discussion, to be able to define between these two uh, leaders new conceptions uh, for the world, I think it is very important in my in my view. And, you know, I think, you know, there are many conceptions which are needed to be discussed. For example, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative being integrated with the Eurasian Economic Union gives the concept for a Eurasian integration from Vladivostok to, uh, to Lissabon. I think this is something which should be placed on the agenda. And naturally, uh, we have campaigned to get the United States and uh, you know these four power uh, agreements uh, also implemented, so it's not a contradiction to a Eurasian conception. I think also the question of a new international security architecture based on such an economic cooperation is very urgent. Uh, there is, as both leaders have said many times, the danger of a new arms race, which uh, you know is really a, a terrible waste and it's also very dangerous. So I think the question of a new international security architecture uh, would be also such a subject. So anyway, I, I just think it's very important both to do both. People need to need, know people, to love the other culture, to know it. But I think leadership is also urgently required in a historical moment like this. Okay. Plays a promo uh, into Chinese, so it's a new area for me because uh, I'm a Chinese instructor and a linguistist. Um, uh, so I work it at Howard University for teaching Chinese. So I think uh, in the uh, prom uh, promo, there's a lot of uh, international uh, political uh, proper nouns. Uh, it's a new new area for me because for writing. Uh, uh, for writing uh, linguistics uh, paper, so I I, I read uh, I re write a lot of uh, dictionary of linguistics. So I think it's a chance to, uh, I can learn some the uh, political uh, practical uh, noun from the Helga and uh, uh, from Helga and uh, uh, Dimitri. So uh, my question to Helga is, uh, uh, what's, a, what's a new uh, paradigm? Uh, can you uh, identify it and uh, explain uh, what's the difference between the new uh, paradigm and the old paradigm? And uh, for uh, Dimitri, uh, uh, so my question is, what's the uh, strategic partnership of Russia and the uh, Eurasia uh, Economic Union and the J8 difference. And uh, can you identify and uh, explain the, what's the difference? Thank you. Okay, Helga, well, you should go the first. Old, the old paradigm is, you know, what I would associate with the present dominant <clears throat> um, belief structure, axiomatic belief structure of the West, which unfortunately is characterized by geopolitics. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, Europe must unite um, to be able to take their role against other great powers like China, Russia, even the United States, now with Trump, especially the United States. And it's also neoliberalism in economics, 
Uh, it's the idea of a neoliberal moral value system. It's an image of man which is associated that either man is only a more advanced animal, which you hear a lot, um, and or the idea that you know there is no way how you can establish a noble truth that every opinion is equally good to the next. And in the cultural realm, it really has become the idea that everything goes. There is no perversity, no, uh, you know, no violence, no ugliness, which is not allowed. As long as you insist, this is my right, I want to be this ugly and I want to be this pornographic and I want to be this violent, it is okay. Now, all of this is are the symptoms of an absolute decaying culture, of a, of a, <clears throat> a system which is really in its agony. Uh, and I think, for example, Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, I think one and a half years ago, he gave a press conference where he said, the values the West is trying to export to our countries are no longer the values which were passed down from generation to generation, but these are what he called post-Christian values, exactly the idea everything goes. And, you know, that is really the problem. You have a system where it's the survival of the fittest, it's an inhuman image of man, the fact that we have this drug epidem epidemic in the United States, that we have a suicide rate which is increasing, that we have the violence in the schools. These are all symptoms of this old paradigm. So I absolutely contrast that with the new paradigm, which defines humanity from the standpoint of the future. How do we want mankind to be in 100 years from now or even in 1,000 years from now? Do we still want to have wars? Or don't you think that the kind of international cooperation which we see right now in space cooperation should be the model of, for how we organize relations among people on the planet Earth. You know, the German um, uh, astronaut Alexander Gerst just went up to the ISS station together with an American uh, female astronaut and a Russian astronaut. And, you know, that kind of collaboration, uh, working on exploration, how should the universe be understood better no, I mean, when you are listening to these astronauts, you get a feeling, you know, I mean, there are two trillion galaxies. Can you imagine two trillion galaxies? And what do we know about them? Absolutely little. And, you know, everything we explore in space uh, is very much leading us to a situation that we are the only species known so far, for sure the only species on the, on the planet Earth, which can travel into space. Why? Because we are the only creative species. So the new paradigm is basically the idea that that which combines individuals and nations is our common identity as creative beings. And you know the future uh, kind of uh, co cooperation among people, I have the image when every child which is born uh, can have access to universal education. Uh, to have no material needs, not excessive riches, but enough so that every child can study universal history, that every child can study other languages and other cultures, have a science education, a classical art education, that the kind of wishes people have will be quite different. If you talk to excellent scientists, they never are greedy. They, they never want to accumulate uh, stocks. They want to do their science. If you talk to good artists, do they want to become millionaires? No, they want to be excellent and truth-seeking in their art. And that's what gives them a fulfilled life. So the new paradigm is actually, you know, that human beings become really human by developing their creativity and that they relate to each other on the basis of the other person's creativity and create something good for all of mankind out of it. Thank you, Helga. I will try to be short in answering your question because it's very easy. Uh, 
I think uh, we shouldn't uh, compare G8 with the uh, Eurasian Economic Union because these are two absolutely different things. Yeah, G8 is kind of discussion club. It's a, it's a forum of uh, uh, eight, now seven heads of states that come together and some ministers, they don't have a charter, they don't have any treaties among them. It's just, you know, temporary construction. Like G20, we value G20 very much because it, uh, it comprises uh, other states which are very important, like, uh, like China, like India, like Indonesia, like Russia. So it would be very difficult to formulate any economic agenda in the world without participation of these states. I think everybody understands this. As for Eurasian Economic Union, it's, it's the organization of uh, economic integration. We have a treaty. Uh, we uh, ceded uh, part of national sovereignty at this supranational level. So it, it can be compared more or less uh, with the European Union. We have Eurasian Economic Commission. It has certain prerogatives to work on in certain spheres on behalf of our five states. And uh, we are trying to enlarge the scope of this uh, supranational responsibility. So this is its, our response to the trend of globalization. We believe in integration. We believe in interaction between different uh, countries and peoples. And our, our response to, to it was uh, Eurasian Economic uh, Project and Eurasian Economic Union. So it is an open project. We promote uh, the idea of integration of integrations. Uh, to bring uh, at one table uh, European Union. So it's kind of expansionist and integrationist project. Uh, and G8 is like closed club, I don't know, something like this. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next. Hi, um, I'm Diane Sayer and a direct, one of the directors of the Schiller Institute Chorus. I wanted to say a couple things first on the American public perception. Uh, as I'm sure you know, when you have people like uh, John Brennan who testified in front of the Congress, I don't do evidence, then becoming an anchor person at NBC, that does call into question the legitimacy of what's in the U.S., news media. Um, I wanted to ask you some questions about Putin's visit to Austria because it looked like he was very warmly received. I was particularly happy about his short meeting with the composer Alma Deutscher and I also understand there were street festivals celebrating the musical culture of Austria and Russia and that um, it, you may be able to confirm if they declared 2018 to be the year of music, something that I heard, which is very optimistic. As you may know, uh, I guess two years ago, a year ago, actually, and a half, a year and a half ago, when we got the horrible news on our Christmas Day of the plane crash carrying the Alexandrov Ensemble, um, for many of us, particularly involved in music, it was like a punch in the stomach. It was a horrible loss. And we organized last year and this year a, a little memorial at the teardrop. And I think, um, contrary to your unfortunate experience with Americans, uh, many, many people actually are very concerned that there be peaceful relations between our countries and also have more knowledge. It turned out that the chaplain who spoke at that memorial, his father or his uncle, had been the translator at the famous meeting at the Elba in World War II. Um, so as Dennis referenced earlier, there can be a much greater friendship and collaboration, but I thought you might have something to say about this question of music, if it is the year of music. And also, I wanted to personally extend to you, and I don't wish to impose upon you, so anyone you wish to send, uh, we will give you tickets to our concert tomorrow at 4 o'clock. I'd love to see you or any representatives there, and we'll give you good seats. <laughs> Thank you very much for these kind words, and I'm really very grateful to, to you and your colleagues for what you're doing in the memory of Alexander Choir. 
And I can tell you that the choir, uh, of course, in different composition, is now re has now reemerged, and there will be a number of concerts uh, in the coming days in, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, of this new choir. Uh, we hope that uh, it will become as popular and as famous as, unfortunately, uh, the previous crew that was uh, that lost their lives in the uh, incident. So, uh, answering your question, uh, well, music and culture are universal values. Uh, they don't they don't need translation. Everybody understands them, and uh, there are a lot of students in. In, uh, in Moscow, specialized uh, institutions, the conservatorium and uh, academies of music and fine arts, and uh, they don't need uh, an interpreter, they don't need translator, they understand uh, very well what people wanted to say. And of course, this is a universal tool, and it will remain as such, regardless of what political conjuncture we have, regardless of all the problems that we may face, because people will still listen to the music, and uh, people will answer, ask themselves questions, what was the country, what was the situation that really helped to, uh, to, for this piece of music to be born. And if, if it's attributed to Russia, of course, people will understand that Russia is not some country that you really can sideline side and put somewhere on the side of sidewalk and ignore. Uh, we have an enormous potential, uh, enormous uh, cultural life. I really miss a lot of Moscow cultural life here because cultural life is very uh, rich in New York, of course. It's one of the centers of the cultural life. But still in Moscow, life is a bit different. And we have more accent on theaters, on music. We have several platforms for classical music. And uh, I'm really looking forward to coming back uh, on my vacation and to seeing my friends there. I have a lot of friends among artists, among performers. And I encourage very much the cultural exchanges uh, with any country, with the United States, with Europe, uh, this, what, this brings me to the point of, uh, of your interest, the visit to Austria. Austria is a very particular country. First of all, the Austrians are very stubborn. <laughs> they really are neutral, and it's very difficult to prove to them their, your point of view if you don't have uh, enough reasoning. That was always. So, so they, uh, I, I, I served in Austria for several months in our bilateral embassy, so I like this country very much. They are very grateful to Russia, to Soviet Union. They still remember that Soviet Union liberated them uh, from Nazism. And we actually uh, are one of the guarantors of Austrian Republic, which is a legal status. And sometimes we act as guarantors still now. We, we have four states. This is sort of post-war construction. So we play a certain role in Austrian politics. That's why it's not very easy to bring uh, in Austrian minds the idea that Russia should be ostracized and isolated and ignored. They resist this idea traditionally. And uh, that's why we maintained dialogue with this country for many, many years. And uh, nothing serious has changed, e even uh, in the context of the sanctions and all these problems that we are having with many countries of the world. Uh, many of them are partners of Austria, but that doesn't change very much. So that's why it's very symbolic that uh, our president uh, visited Austria after his uh, uh, re-election right now. This is a gesture. This is a gesture to the uh, to people there who came to power and who are very friendly, who are very e eager to cooperate. It's not that we are trying to use them uh, to create certain instability in Europe, uh, to, to break the ranks among the Europe, European Union. It's up to them to decide what they're doing. But there are more and more voices saying that the sanctions against Russia are detrimental to, to European Union. It's not a very big problem for the United States because our economic operation uh, is very symbolic on, on many issues. But when it comes to Europe, People really lose a lot of uh, things uh, because of these sanctions. They lose working uh, places. Uh, they, they lose contracts. Uh, can you imagine how difficult it will be now for producers of agricultural products to come back to Russian market because we've got used to our own production? Uh, well, why do we need uh, some, something which is more expensive when the quality is the same and price is much less? So they already lost this market. And Car producers also have difficulties. Those who took uh, political decisions uh, of leaving Russia, they, they regret it now. But, well, politics come, comes above e uh, economics here, and this, this is not right. So the Austrians, they managed to uh, 
to keep this balance and always remain a bridge between Russia and European Union. Since Soviet times, as you might know, uh, Austria was the first sort of hub for, for Russian gas, for Soviet gas towards, uh, towards Europe, and this is also very, sim- very symbolic. That's why it's not a, co- it's not a coincidence. And uh, we, uh, uh, we have uh, pro- programs of cultural exchanges and years of culture not only with Austria but with many countries, even with such countries as United Kingdom, regardless of the fact how difficult our political relations can be. People still want to listen to, to, to Russian music, to see Russian ballet, uh, and to visit Russia. There are a lot of uh, English fans who are coming to visit uh, World Cup uh, these days, uh, though there were different terrible stories on British uh, TV and media about uh, Russians uh, beating English fans, uh, bear, bears walking in the streets, and I don't know. All this, all this is coming back. Uh, so p- I think people here and people in, in Europe are much wiser sometimes than politicians. They know what they, what they want, and it's very difficult to, uh, to spoil with this political, I would say, foam, which is now on the top, to spoil the deep-rooted uh, feelings and interests, uh, mutual interests between, uh, between Russians and Europeans and Americans. And uh, I hope this will prevail in, in the nearest future. Thank you. Because of time constraints, let me just indicate that we we're going to take the next two questions, and that will probably be it, because at 155 as of right now, and if we are going to have answers from both our Russian representative and Helga, that probably will be the bracket of our time. So go right ahead. Hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, my question is for you, Mr. Polyansky. Uh, the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche movement more generally has been involved for decades in trying to communicate to the American population the role of the British in determining U.S. policy as well as public opinion among the American population. And uh, a few months ago, Maria Zakharova gave a speech outlining some of the really horrific history of the British Empire. And now, with the ongoing attacks against our elected president, you are beginning to see evidence surface of the role of British intelligence in um, trying to undermine the decision of the American population in electing President Trump. Uh, My question is whether you think among the Russian people or among the Russian uh, institutions, there is a understanding of the distinction between the United States and the British poisoning of U.S. policy and, and public opinion. It's a very philosophic uh, question, I would say. Uh, I, I didn't analyze this as deep as you, uh, the role of uh, British intelligence and Britain in influencing uh, public opinion. I know that the United Kingdom and the United States are very close. You speak one language, more or less. So you really uh, have the same values and uh, you have no constraints in traveling. Uh, that's why it's understandable that there is a mutual, uh, I would say, influence uh, between London and, and Washington, and, it, and this is very good. Uh, as for the intelligence, well, the United Kingdom is not the only country that possesses intelligence in the world. There are other countries uh, which can uh, have counterintelligence, and uh, this, is, this is the rule of the game. A- every action uh, causes certain uh, reaction to this action. So the, the stronger they try to do something bad, uh, the stronger will be the response everywhere. I, and I, I'm sh- absolutely sure that in this country people will understand uh, that they are be- being manipulated at some, at some point, and... Uh, uh, they will make the conclusions themselves. We're not, we're not imposing our opinion anywhere, but we like the films about James Bond, really. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's stick to it. Uh, let's keep the image of efficient British intelligence based on these films, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next. Hi, my question is very simple for Mr. Polianski. 
What do you think of the idea of young people advocating for the alliance against war? That's a good instinct, but what only, what only, why only young people? I think everybody wants to live and survive. Uh, I think young people, maybe they uh, don't have uh, a lot of uh, institutional memory about what has happened in previous years, and this is an asset here. So they, they do not prejudge the, the situation uh, from the stereotypes that sometimes we have and our elder uh, colleagues do have. Uh, well, youth is the key to everything. We are doing everything for our children, for our grandchildren. And, of course, their interests should prevail, and uh, they shouldn't be ignored. And, again, if you take this country, the dem demographic situation is one, Russia situation in Russia, the demographic situation is another, but close to this country. But if you take Africa, for example, you will see that the number of, of very young people, like 14, 15, would be close to 50 percent, even more, uh, which is a big, big challenge. And uh, it's a question of education that should be really put on the agenda because, uh, well, it's, it's our responsibility. It's the key to everything, education and uh, uh, good uh, atmosphere and uh, good environment. Uh, so it's, it's our task to, de to give the conditions and uh, the basis for, for these young people uh, to, to get the understanding of the life, to get the uh, uh, ideals uh, that would not be harmful to the world, that would be uh, promoting cooperation and friendship, that would exclude uh, hate speech, uh, not to zombie them, but to give them an open mind. If there are more and more open-minded people not biased, uh, not uh, limited by any ideological uh, framework, that, that would be beneficial to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're almost at our, uh, well, we actually are now at our break point, but I want to do two things. First, I, I hope, I don't know what Mr. Polianski's schedule is, but we're about to go into a break. Perhaps if there are one or two individual questions for him, he may be able to answer them. Uh, but Helga, I'd like you to uh, give us a kind of summary uh, remarks. We're at the conclusion of our first session, and I wonder if you either want to respond to either of the last uh, exchanges or you just want to give us sort of a, a summary uh, statement at this point. Well, I think that the historical moment is totally exciting. Uh, I think, you know, there are periods where, you know, things are sort of stable, normal, decade long, uh, nothing much changes and nothing much can be done um, because history is in a, in a more, you know, calm mode. I think this is clearly not the case of our present time. I mean, we see changes which are so traumatic. Almost every day you have some breaking development uh, where, you know, as I said, new strategic alignments are occurring, uh, new conceptions are being put forward. And, you know, I think it's a very exciting moment to live and to have the idea that, you know, there are objective conditions naturally and you cannot always you know, change those because they are too big or too gigantic to to be uh, influenced. But a, a time of such epochal transformation is also the best time where ideas matter. And, you know, I can only say that, you know, the ideas of my husband, Linda LaRouge, who has been working on these kinds of conceptions of a just new world economic order, for more than half a century, as a matter of fact, you know, probably more 70, 75 years or, yeah, something like, or even even longer than that. Uh, but now they are becoming influential. I mean, what uh, Jason was mentioning, I mean, his work in terms of, you know, having this idea that the underdevelopment of the developing sector must be overcome, uh, you know, his conceptions, many, many uh, scientific conceptions he revived in terms of the 2,500 years of European civilization. So a lot of these things are now coming into being because you have some powerful countries who are 
actually realizing them and working in this direction. So the power of ideas is, is absolutely crucial. And I think that, you know, we are very fortunate that, you know, while I'm not diminishing the dangers which are still there, uh, also, you know, the possible danger of a, a big war is not by far eliminated. But I want people to have the optimistic sense that we can experience not only in our lifetime, but in the very near future, a completely different kind of a world if we activate ourselves and if we fight for it. Because, you know, right now you have the constellation where many countries of the world are much more optimistic. The mood in African countries is absolutely changed. Latin America is changed. And also in Eurasia, you have many countries and peoples in countries talking about the future in a much more optimistic way than we see it for the most part in the United States or in Germany for that matter. So I think if people have a vision that with your own work, you can help to create a more human world, world and that change is absolutely possible. I think we can do it and we should be happy about it and be self-assured and confident in our ability to make a better world. Thank you, Helga. All right, so we're about to take our break. We want to make sure that people stop at the literature table. I was asked about Jason's report. It is there, extending the New Silk Road to West Asia and Africa. Uh, and you can see him back there at the table if you wish to ask him, him anything else about it. Uh, and uh, we are going to be taking a break right now. Also, stop by the table. Those of you who are not members of the Schiller Institute, you should certainly join it today. Um, there is a restaurant on the fifth floor, uh, and there are restaurants immediately to the left and right downstairs. Uh, let me just caution people that you are not allowed to bring uh, food into the room or into the hotel. You can see the people at, my, at the desk there who will tell you a little bit more about the particular restaurants. Uh, and what we'll do, since we're at 2.05, we'll reconvene at 2.35. Okay. <laughs>